We are one issue away from the end of Nintendo Power's sixth year, with issue 58 for April of 1994. We have a high-profile sports game, an action game based on an aggressively mediocre sci-fi TV show, and our first look at one of the classic games for the Super Nintendo. Let's get started. Our cover game for this issue is Ken Griffey Jr. Presents Major League Baseball, with Griffey himself on the cover, posing like he's playing a Super Nintendo. Well, he's probably not actually playing a Super Nintendo. Not much of a theme on the letters column for this issue. Probably the two coolest letters are the kid who made a Game Boy Bank in shop class, and the kid who took an issue of Nintendo Power with him to the French Catacombs. to take a picture of himself with it there. We start off with our cover game, which I'm going to shorten to Ken Griffey Jr. Baseball for the sake of brevity. The game boasts a Major League Baseball team license and editable rosters, which is good because the game doesn't have the Major League Baseball Players Association license. Yeah, so not only does this game not have the major, the Players Association license, well, there's a very wide assortment of gag names for uh, team members. For example, the Seattle Mariners includes Howard Lincoln among their players, and I found myself playing against a team containing James Bond, Philip Marlowe, John Steed, and a E. Peel. As you can expect with when you're going up against the earlier Avengers and 007, and a hardball private investigator, I found myself very outmatched. Now, I did end up encountering a lot less foul balls in this game than I've encountered in earlier baseball games. Fielding is a mixed bag, uh, but batting was less present to pull off than fielding is, since I was never really able to figure out the timing for batting, which is not helped by some of the more wonky batting stance that some of the players have. I was able to figure out a few times when I should not have swung at a pitch, but that's only really useful knowledge when you've gotten the timing down when you can judge when you should swing at a pitch. Next up is the Super Nintendo version of Star Trek The Next Generation, which appears to be billed as a hybrid space sim and adventure game. The article has maps of the early missions. Star Trek The Next Generation works as a game when you are on the ground, managing your away team. It's straightforward, and the controls work really well, with some good level design, and from there you can get some interesting puzzles. The space combat, however, is absolute crap. Moving the Enterprise around is very difficult, and you can't do anything to handle damage control or manage power levels, which means that you can handle weaker opponents without too many issues. But anyone who is the Enterprise D's equal, like a Romulan Warbird, is going to clean your clock. You can't run away from these fights either. You can surrender, which is effectively equivalent to the game over, or you can lose, which is a game over. You're just out of luck. <clears throat> Next is Mickey's Ultimate Challenge, our first Disney game in a while that isn't from Capcom, and it appears to be aimed for young audiences. If you took the bizarre inanity of an edutainment game aimed for very young kids, and attached to a game that was too hard and had any rights to be, you would have this game. This is a title where the first challenge requires you to jump on books in alphabetical order. Except the books in the puzzle change randomly whenever you die, making it a little too difficult for young children to learn the puzzle. Further, the platforms are moving vertically over a bottomless pit, and at random some books will disappear from out from under you, causing you to plummet to your death. Now, you have unlimited lives, which makes this less of an issue, but you're still starting over from scratch. Who the hell thought this was a good gameplay idea? Especially for a freaking edutainment game. We're talking, in this specific instance, about a puzzle meant to teach kids their letters, not Odell Lake or the Oregon Trail, where you're teaching kids about what wildlife has to contend with, and what settlers traveling on the Oregon Trail had to contend with, respectively. This is supposed to just teach the basics. Oy. Following this up is Excalibur 2097, a cyberpunk-themed action brawler that appears to be based on a comic, though some cursory research isn't finding anything. This game is 90s as hell. From the music, which is by... Psycho, uh, techno group Psychosonic with two Ks, 
to the narration of the opening cutscene to the enemies you fight. You don't have absurdly large guns or large quantities of pouches, but it does have you leaping through a cyberpunk dystopia cutting up enemies armed or armed with guns using your sword. That said, this is a game that would have really merited having combat move at a pace similar to the Shinobi series of the Genesis, where most enemies go down in one hit, maybe two for the thugs. Further, the attacks that you use have attack motions that are unfortunately similar. Your thrust and your slash both attack on a horizontal plane. Having the thrust work horizontally and the slash work vertically would work better from a mechanical standpoint, differentiating between the two and recognizing that different wor moves work better in different circumstances and would intersect with enemies' hitboxes in different ways. It changes up your verbs in that respect. Um, but by having them both work at the same horizontal or mostly horizontal angle, it makes it a little too difficult to effectively do damage to lower e height enemies and that sort of thing. Next up is our first look at Super Metroid. It's a cover game later, so I'm going to save the game for then. The art article gives a rundown of Samus' moon set, along with a glimpse of some of the area maps. Next up is Time Tracks, based on the fairly mediocre UPN science fiction TV show. The article gives maps of some of the early levels and notes on levels uh, 4 through 5. Time Tracks is a game that starts with a 5 minute opening cutscene, which is thankfully skippable, which serves only to provide exposition describing how awesome our protagonist is and the basic premise of the Time Tracks TV series before starting the game where you have around three lives and no continues. It makes for a really frustrating game as the levels are kind of large and can be tricky to learn, and often have some enemies that are significant hit sponges. Having continues would make the process of learning the game considerably easier, while not reducing the game's difficulty in particular. Continuing on with the Super Nintendo titles, we have Turn and Burn No Fly Zone, a flight simulator, and going from the gameplay notes, a fairly hardcore one. We get some information on the dogfighting mechanics. So, I'm unable to find controls for this game. Not in manuals online, not well, as far as for a, a digital copy of the manual I can use, not in a fact for the game, not even inside the game itself. And this is a very hardcore flight sim. So unless you find a copy with the manual, maybe give this a miss. We wrap up the Super Nintendo titles with two pinball games, Super Pinball and Pinball Dreams. Super Pinball takes advantage of the Super Nintendo controller in the most logical way for a pinball game, mapping the flippers to the shoulder buttons in addition to the D-pad and face buttons. As far as the game itself goes, the physics feel alright and the table designs are as about as advanced as the Super Nintendo can handle while still being grounded in something a physical pinball machine can do. The game's conquest mode is a little wonky though, as the conditions to advance to the next table are a little excessive. Now, with Pinball Dreams on the other hand, the table designs work well enough, so I feel like the controls are a little sluggish. In particular, the flippers are only controlled using the D-pad and the A button, and the left flipper will only move when the D-pad is pressed down all the way. This is kind of an issue because with physical pinball, the flippers generally react very quickly to pressing the button to activate the flipper. That's why using the shoulder buttons work so well in Super Pinball. They're less analog, or they're less digital I should say, and have less traversal, so they replicate how responsive the buttons are on a pinball machine much better. In classified information, we get a 99 lives code for Super Empire Strikes Back. In the Super Metroid comic, Samus' armor gets damaged, forcing her to leave Zebes in order to make contact with the Chozo. In Counselor's Corner, we get a few tips for Lufia and a walkthrough for the first half of Crystallis. We get a developer profile of Interplay, with a particular focus on their console background instead of their PC work, which they will probably become more well known for. For our Game Boy title, we have Prehistoric Man, that's with a K. 
our first caveman platformer in a while. We have maps and notes for the first three stages. Prehistoric Man is a pretty generic caveman platformer. The characters and enemy designs have some, well, character, and I appreciate the fact that it tells you where enemies pop out. But in order for you to get extra points and replenish health, you need to collect three bones which pop out of an enemy that damaged you. Or you can similarly get enemies to drop bones by jumping on them, which multiplies the point bonus for killing it. However, if the bones scroll off screen, they disappear, and the field of view is a little too close for you to be able to grab all three bones without scrolling off the screen on most occasions. Further, there isn't, from what I can tell, a down attack. So after you've jumped to your opponent twice, when you move out of the way to attack them, you're now either out of position to hit them, or you're going to get hit. Now this is, from what I can tell, a port of a PC platformer, and I can see the game working considerably better there. And the sequel to this game gets a release for the Super Nintendo under a different time later, so hopefully that version works out better. Wrapping up our games for this issue is the Jungle Book for the NES, which gets the maps for a handful of stages. Jungle Book is a bit too non-linear for a platformer on the NES, in the sense that it doesn't particularly communicate what the game's objectives are in the game itself. Yes, there's information in the strategy guide for this issue, but the game has to stand alone outside of that, and in this case it doesn't. I reached the far side of the first level and nothing happens, which meant that I needed to go find something else and the game didn't quite clearly communicate to me what that was and where I needed to go to get it. In the top 20 column, Super Street Fighter 2 Turbo has clawed past Mortal Kombat for the top spot on the Super NES. Of note in the now playing column is Ninja Warriors, Natsume Championship Wrestling, and Pirates of Dark Water, all for the Super Nintendo. And in the Pack Watch column, we get more hype for Project Reality, with the focus this time being on how cartridges are totally cheaper than CDs, you guys. Um, no, no, not really. At this time, CDs are, drives are certainly more expensive, but as the tech develops, CD drives get cheaper, while the cost of manufacture for cartridges will stay more or less the same. On the positive side, though, we get our first screenshots of Final Fantasy III. My pick for this issue is Excalibur 2097. It's not a great game, but then again, this isn't a great issue, game selection mark. However, Excalibur's pure, unfiltered, 90s tone just really makes it stand out from the pack and rise above the rest. It's a game where I admit my appeal, that its appeal to me is purely based on sort of ironic nostalgia. If you want to call me a hipster for that, feel free, but that is what makes Excalibur 2097 stand out to me, to a degree. Next time, we get the results of the Nestor Awards, and we wrap up Hendo Powers, sixth year. See you then. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please like and subscribe, and please click the notification button to be notified whenever new episodes of the show go live. If you really like the show, please consider backing my Patreon at patreon.com slash count zero OR. Backers can view episodes up to one week early, and also pick future games for Let's Plays. Thank you for watching.